be 3 million trafficked people within the OSCE area. Sometimes I think, is it really that bad? Well, it all depends on what you're picturing. Don't picture a woman chained to a bed behind a locked door. There are a few like that, but that's not the general trafficking victim. Picture the person who washes your car, the woman who cares for your nails, the child begging on the metro, the person building the bridge, making your clothes, cleaning your hotel room, picking your carrots, and certainly a huge proportion of the women who are selling their bodies. You'll know that prostitution is legal in the Netherlands. Even the Amsterdam police estimate that between 50 and 90% of people in prostitution in their city are coerced into being there. So it's a legal trade, it's a tourism attraction, and it's making the repeated rape of hundreds of women per night possible. Okay, even the Amsterdam police will say that. Someone is trafficked from a legal definition when they've been deceived or coerced into work, they've been moved, although not necessarily far, doesn't have to be international, and they're being exploited. Exploitation would mean there's little or no money, poor living conditions, um, menace. There may be violence, there may be locked doors, there may be threats, but not always. The, the chains that trap people can be psychological, it can be um, drugs, it can be debt, it can be an abusive relationship, it can be shame, black magic curses, fear of being classed as an illegal immigrant. I think often educated, successful people like, like us, we think, oh, how could that be? But we, we haven't suffered the abuse through life that ends up that someone is totally stuck and trapped. Human trafficking is big business because a person can be sold again and again. Organized crime groups control most of the trade and it's very sophisticated and complicated. And our response needs to be the same. But sadly, it's not. There's, if you think about your country, how many times have you seen in the news investigation of human trafficking cases, successful prosecution, and good conviction? Not just a fine, not just six months in prison suspended, you know, proper punishment. How often does that happen? Victims can be treated as criminals. I mean, actually, they often are engaged in criminal activity, but that's because they've been trapped into that. We often see the collusion of police and politicians, and a blind eye is turned to the advertising of sexual services that's connected to trafficking. A blind eye is turned to the begging children. I mean, how many times has a begging child come up to you and you think, why aren't they in school? Well, why aren't they in school? There's exploitation going on. And of course, we all benefit from very, very cheap consumer goods, and we don't like to ask questions about where they've come from. Your handout has lots of quotes, but let me just read you one. Trafficking in human beings is the slavery of our times. Often a complex transnational phenomenon, trafficking in human beings is rooted in vulnerability to poverty, lack of democratic cultures, gender inequality, violence against women, conflict and post-conflict situations, lack of social integration, lack of opportunities and employment, lack of access to education, child labour and discrimination. It is for this reason that trafficking in human beings must be addressed in an integrated, multidisciplinary way and with the involvement of a diverse set of actors. So that's the European Commission's report. And those diverse set of actors, some of those actors need to be God's people. And there are two particular reasons, well there's three. One, clearly God hates um, exploitation and suffering. It's an international problem and we are an international family and it's a problem of evil and we have <coughs> access to God's divine resources to defeat the forces of evil. So let's get involved. Proverbs 24. 11 to 12. Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, 
Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay everyone according to what they have done? William Wilberforce was surely thinking of these verses when he said about slavery um, 200 years ago, you may choose to look the other way, but you can never again say you did not know. Now, we're not telling you about human trafficking to make you feel guilty because now you know you need to do something about it. That's not what it's about. And some of you may end up being called to be involved in quite a specific way. Others of you won't, but you're all leaders and people listen to you. So you all have an opportunity to um, at least pass on concern, pass on information, help point people in the right direction if they want to get involved. So, yeah, um, listen to this and don't think, oh, I don't do human trafficking and sexual exploitation ministry. Um, you have influence, so you can help others. Let me just briefly mention the European Freedom Network that the European Evangelical Alliance set up. Um, when there was the bicentenary of um, Wilberforce um, getting rid of slavery in the British Empire, many Christians um, got interested in the issue of modern day slavery. And so we wanted to connect people together so they didn't all reinvent the wheel because people had been, others had been involved in this ministry for many years before. And we created the European Freedom Network to help the body of Christ across Europe to work effectively to combat all forms of human trafficking, so not just sexual, um, for sexual purposes, um, and also all forms of sexual exploitation. And to date, there are 130 partners in 32 nations, and they're working in every kind of anti-trafficking ministry. So that could be um, intercession, prevention, outreach on the streets, intervention, uh, restoration, um, and advocacy. And can I just, um, a little aside, we don't separate out what one might call the normal prostitutes from the trafficked prostitutes, okay? Because we strongly argue that we should have compassion on all people caught up in prostitution, and the vast majority of people in prostitution are trapped. They may have chosen to do what they're doing, but they're not really, or they're not choosing to stay. They are trapped by their pimp, who's often their boyfriend and drug dealer. They're trapped by drugs, by poverty, um, the effects of child abuse. They suffer violence and other health issues. And there, there's a spectrum of suffering and exploitation and criminality. There's a very few people in prostitution who feel totally in control, well paid, don't seem bothered. But that is a very small minority. There's a spectrum that ends up with the person chained to a bed. And the law may make a distinction, but we don't believe the Christians should. Um, and in the middle, it's very hard to tell the difference. And also, of course, because prostitution um, is tolerated, if not legalised, in many nations, that's what allows traffickers the opportunity to provide the sex workers. Um, so prostitution basically fuels trafficking. So back to um, the European Freedom Network. We like to use the analogy of a bridge. Not enough women, men and children successfully make the journey from their position of exploitation to full freedom because it's a very long and difficult journey. Psychological, financial, spiritual, social, legal, all sorts of problems make it hard. And we believe that by working together, the body of Christ can help build a secure bridge so make sure there are enough planks and the planks are lined up so that the person thinks well okay I dare to step out onto the bridge. We can't, no individual ministry or kind of ministry can solve the problem. We need to be working together, communicating, sharing information, collaborating, including um, with secular agencies so that the bridge is secure. So EFN, we've um, brought partners together to map the problem and the solutions. We're now working on filling those gaps, and some of those gaps have, um, we've already been doing, so um, helping projects create good practice standards and know how to assess themselves, advocacy um, on how to influence society, um, and decision makers on um, prostitution and human trafficking, um, 
assisting people in the stuff that Marina's going to be talking about in terms of EU, EU and um, Council of Europe opportunities. <coughs> um, we've been um, trying to help projects learn the best ways of restoration ministries, um, so business admission, um, education, etc. We've developed a secure database of aftercare services so we can quickly help people find care. Um, and we have other plans if we can get the funding. And we have a, we have a specialist um, Facebook page for interaction, but we also have a non-specialist Facebook page. Um, and we're going to be having a quarterly newsletter for non-specialists. And I guess my, my best EFM moment is when we see that there's an individual <coughs> who's escaped but needs to get to another country immediately um, for real um, safety and because of the network we're able to help that kind of thing. Um, yeah, In January, um, partners were able to quickly investigate whether an employment agency was genuine. Um, Eastern Europeans were being promised jobs, I think it was in London, and looking around we decided well we were really not sure at all that it was genuine um, and one of the partners wrote afterwards EFN is the closest modern version of the underground railroad that I can imagine that was the, um, the network that helped slaves escape from the southern states of America so there's still a lot to do um, but we've given ourselves a daring strap line which is that with God and with each other we are changing the situation but what can you do if you're not a specialist. Prayer. We always say we should pray. No, we really should pray. This is a spiritual warfare is needed because this is such a huge evil. Find out about your country's human trafficking response or lack of response. How can you ch strengthen the good, challenge the bad, and get the gaps filled? Find out about the NGO's actions to prevent exploitation or intervene and help, help people find a way out, ask how you can pray, and think about how you can get more directly involved, and watch for the news. Pray for the police, judges, journalists, politicians. Pray for the eyes of society to be open. People who are trafficked travel. People who are in um, being sexually exploited ends up in hospital quite, regu quite often because of um, violence that's happened to them, um, abortions, etc. Can we um, open the eyes of the silent majority of people who, if they knew there was a victim of exploitation in front of them, they'd want to do something, but they don't know what to look for, and if they were suspicious, they wouldn't know what to do. And you can join the events Facebook page. We have a pause to pray each month, which you can do in 30 seconds, or you can do in um, much longer, but it, it's brief. And it looks at um, a brief item of pan-European news, and then we focus in on a country. And you can raise, raise awareness in your church. And in the end, yeah, we need to base everything we do on a biblical perspective on slavery and exploitation, how we care for the vulnerable, um, how the, we relate between the sexes, because often the, um, the issue with, that makes um, so much sexual exploitation possible is the fact that male-female relationships in a culture are just not healthy. Um, and there's a bit, bit higher level of what you could do. Support people who are looking for work. In Central and Eastern Europe in particular, People are desperately um, vulnerable to being exploited because they haven't got a job and there aren't any jobs around in their nation. So if people are, going to, are thinking about going abroad to work or to study, advise them, try and help them check out where are they going. And if you've got any worries, contact EFN. Um, we can't guarantee, but we can sniff around and see what we can do for you. Promote fair trade. So goods that have been produced that are not, in, not involving slave labour and exploitation. A massively important thing to do that churches are already doing, and we should celebrate it and do more, is to work with children, young people, and vulnerable families in general. So yes, we should protect um, the church community's young people from being exploited, but it's also the non-church kids. So that 
people get trafficked when they come from poor families, families with domestic abuse, families where there are massive problems. And perhaps the best thing that churches can do that you kind of think, well, it's got nothing to do with human trafficking. Well, it does. Working with vulnerable families will stop exploitation. And it includes working with the boys, because the boys <coughs> are going to end up being the potential pimps and traffickers. So let's work with them. And then what would your church do if someone came into your congregation who had been working in prostitution, or even is still working in prostitution? but who's beginning to want to come out. How do we learn to welcome unconditionally the vulnerable and those who are coming out of exploitation? And then pornography. Pornography is prostitution with a camera and is so often exploitative and linked to crime. And so many people have a problem with it. John Lennox mentioned it this morning. So we need to not pretend it's not a problem. Um, within church or within society and we need to find ways of helping people um, overcome the desire to see it. You can volunteer with a project and that doesn't mean you have to go out on the streets um, into the red light district. It can involve that but it doesn't have to. You can be teaching language skills, you can do all sorts of things and you can engage in targeted advocacy. Often you are the guys that know about how to influence society, politicians, society, the media, the specialist NGOs know all about exploitation, but they don't know how to speak it in a way the society will listen. So that was a general look. I'm going to hand over to Marina, who's going to focus in more on the politics. Well, thank you, Julia, because we are working together. I represent Care for Europe. My name is Marina Zaitseva, and I work in the world of advocacy. Basically, Care for Europe, we work on both ways. We're working with EU institutions to make sure that human trafficking is always on the agenda, and we work with the civil society, for example, with European Evangelical Alliance and other members of EFN, just to make sure that they know what's happening in the EU institutions. They can implement it and use as a tool what they're doing. So, um, so I'll, I'll try to practically and very simply to show you the tools European Union and non-European Union countries have at your, expo uh, at your exposition. And um, how does it work? Okay. So basically, yesterday, uh, Johannes paved the way talking about EU institutions, say you don't have an excuse, you have national government, you have European Parliament, and therefore you have your voice being heard on any political issue. So I would like to use this agenda to how we can implement it while we are trying to tackle the issues of human trafficking and exploitation. Well, because our audience is EU and non-EU audience, that's why I will talk about EU citizens first and then non-EU citizens because it doesn't work the same way. So for EU citizens, why we can tackle the uh, issues of human trafficking? First of all, our main, main uh, instrument <coughs> is the Charter of the Fundamental Rights, which uh, Article 5, I'm just trying to help you to, uh, the reason I'm telling you about so you can in your advocacy, know your uh, basic foundations, of how you can tackle it on national and international level. So basically, Article 5 of the Charter of the Fundamental Rights says, trafficking in human being is, is prohibited. That's very simple, you can make it more simple than that. Then yesterday we also were talking about European Commission. European Commission taking the human trafficking very seriously, and therefore in 2011, and how does it work further? Okay. They wrote a directive. This is the number of the directive. In the other words, it says on preventing and combating <coughs> trafficking in human beings and protecting victims. So uh, it's, a, it's a very long document. Uh, I have it uh, on, the, on the table. By the way, on this table, you can look at these documents, what European institutions are doing. And over there, I printed out some documents and the press releases. You can just take it or make a copy and do it for yourself. So. Uh, for you not to be overwhelmed, human trafficking is uh, an issue which cannot be tackled. There are instruments, and therefore Article 18 of the directive says very clearly and specifically to ask member states of European Union to discourage and reduce the demand. 
the second article is about us to work in cooperation with the civil society. And you can read the, uh, what third, third says. Number four is to say to establish as a criminal offense to use services, basically to criminalize those who use sexual services. So this is the European Commission doing. And it's not, sometimes we think that uh, EU institutions making documents and they're not implemented or just only on the paper. That's not, it's up to us to bring those people into account with the documents they are, uh, they are writing. But European Commission have done uh, the strategy. Basically, by 2016, well, first of all, this, di this directive has to be used in all national legislations. There are 28 member states at this moment, 21 member states have ratified this directive into their uh, national uh, legislation, transformed. Basically, they need to see how directive is used in their national law. Some of them did not have done it yet. Then after that, there is a strategy from 2012 to 2016, how this directive will be used in life. And it's a very, very practical tool if you're gonna study it. It has a, uh, who is doing, when is doing, and the deadline when it's gonna be done. And it's not only that, European Commission, as we've learned yesterday, have to do a report to the Parliament and to the uh, European Council of what has been done. So by the next year, there need to be a report how member states has transformed this directive into the national uh, legislation. Why I'm telling you to that? I'm not, I'm not talking to lawyers for the case of, of a study case. That's the time for you to talk to, because as Julia was talking before, what is your national government doing on human trafficking? Because sometimes, as, as I remember the anti-trafficking coordinator, European Commission said, we sometimes we are worrying about plastic bottles more than uh, lives of those people who've been trafficked. And if you think it's all of them coming from Eastern Europe or from Nigeria, it is the case, but 62% but of human trafficked people are coming from European Union countries. Because there is a freedom of movement, it's much easier to, to do it. It's harder to, find, to, uh, to tackle it or to see it, it's bigger money. Nobody wants to risk and bring people from other countries where it can be easily done in European Union with European Union citizens. So, so do not think it's uh, just from far away, it's closer than you think. That's why I'm trying to help you how you can tackle your national government. That's one step. Then member states have to work with the, with the, uh, with the uh, civil society. That's why I do not think that, uh, and, uh, and also establishes a criminal offense. So after that, I'm not gonna go more into details about the directive. Uh, and I already talked about, uh, so first step, they need to comply. And the second step, but 2016, national government have to establish criminal offense for the use of criminal of the of the service of victims basically they have to be punished and it has to be written like uh, like julia was saying before in many countries it's still uh, legalized prostitution that's why you cannot bring these people to the court but but 2016 of course it says here if the object of expectations of trafficking in human beings Sometimes it's very hard to define whether they've been trafficked or not, and many victims, I'm not gonna go into the details because we don't have time, would never testify for themselves. But uh, it is in legislations to tackle it. Then after that, uh, well, we can read further about the penalties. So basically, I've, I've mentioned a little bit about EU strategy. It's concrete measures, and you can study it further if you have time and interested. Then, then we're looking at the body where you can influence directly, it's European Parliament. You vote for the member states, you need to ask them what are they doing about uh, the trafficking in human beings. Not long ago, European Parliament have written the policy on citizens' rights and um, on sexual exploitation and prostitution and its impact on gender equality. So that's European Parliament document. Another document which have, we have been advocating about and uh, very happy it, it has been adopted, it's Honeyball Report. Remember yesterday we were talking about that reports in European Parliament are under the name of a 
person who wrote it, Robert. Uh, so the, it's a British uh, conservative, Ma uh, Mary Honeywell, who wrote a report on sexual exploitation and prostitution and its impact on gender equality, saying very directly that uh, to uh, combat to uh, to combat human trafficking by banning on the purchase of sexual services, and then. It has different suggestions. What is the suggestions? To raise awareness about my, my it's, it's a long report. It's 25 <coughs> pages. You can always read it. It's a very interesting report. Very easily downloadable, as well as the, uh, uh, the strategy. And you can read it, and it will give you ideas what European Parliament is uh, suggesting to do to combat child prostitution, to have uh, raising awareness in schools and colleges. So basically, sometimes we are thinking in our uh, civil society organization, so we are the one only coming up with ideas and only the one who are caring about situation. It is taken on European Union level, and therefore we need and have to. It was one of our uh, suggestions for members of the parliament for the next election to make a phone call, to write to them and say, what are you doing on this issue? They have to respond because you voted for them. Or even if you didn't want for them, but they represent your constituency, they have to respond to you on the issues. And when they receive, as yesterday, for example, uh, Johannes was telling, 200,000 emails, they would raise this issue even higher. And therefore, you will have an impact on uh, doing something international level on combating the issue. I'm not going to go into more details. You can start the, uh, the report. Then we're going to go a little bit further. I talk about European Union. You, you, can, you can look at, you can uh, lobby through your national government, through European Parliament, to influence European Commission or vice versa, European Commission to national government and the European Parliament, right? But if you are not a member of, uh, of European Union, there's another instrument called, called Council of Europe, which consists of 47 countries. So there are member states and more. And uh, the Council of Europe also have created their own body. Well, first of all, I'm talking to you about, there was another excellent report uh, written by Portuguese Mendes Botta, Prostitution, Trafficking, and Modern Slavery in Europe, basically saying absolutely the same thing, criminalizing the purchase of sexual services. Based on the Swedish model, I will talk about Swedish model a little bit later. And you can t to ban the advertising, and it also have very specific steps where you can, uh, as your organization, as you individually, look at and see what can be applied or how Council of Europe countries apply that into, 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 in their participating states. Then, if we're gonna go, I, I did not move, right? Okay. Then, if we're gonna talk about the Council of Europe, so there are 47 countries. Council of Europe document, directive was for European Commission, right? Council of Europe has their legal instrument. It's, it's called the Convention on Acts on Action Against Trafficking in Human Being. It's an excellent, well, this, uh, this document is a legal doc document to uh, fight against human trafficking. And what Council of Europe has done, they create a group. It's called Greta, in other words, Group of Experts on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings. And what they do, they go to each country and then they write report what this country is doing. At this moment, 47, 42 countries out of 47 have uh, ratified this convention. <coughs> One of the countries which ratified the convention is not part of European Union, is Belarus. So they're not, but the, so there is, they're already doing it. And then what GRED is doing, they're going to country and see what are they doing, how they're complying with this convention. So at this moment, uh, uh, Greta has created 30 reports you can go to, uh, you can take pictures of the slides if you want to, and, or it's very easily Googled. You can see the country report, and you can see what uh, Council of Europe had, uh, what was the national response to this convention in your own country, and, and therefore, and then come back to your country, what they have done or what they have not done. So it's a, it's a quite useful tool to use and know what is your country doing on the issue. Then, um, then, if Council of Europe doesn't help you, there is another instrument you can use. It's called Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, which is very useful, in, for example, in many Eastern European countries. There are 57 participating states, and they also are doing a, gr a great job. What, what, uh, Council, uh, what uh, OSCE is doing, 
they do realize as much as the same as we do to tackle uh, human trafficking issues it, it has to be a combat actions therefore they are doing joint forces so uh, OEC working together with the Council of Europe trying to use all the resources in order to tackle the issues on international level and therefore it's and uh, and, and this therefore they created the alliance against trafficking and person expert coordination team so you can look and see what has been done in your country and uh, and they have reports in in uh, many languages so you, you can look what the Council of Europe is doing no, I, I'm sorry, uh, OEC is doing. So that's, I think I give you enough basic. You can, basically what Johannes was telling yesterday was trying to tell you today. Practically, there are so many tools you can use to see, I mean, what I'm trying to say to you, yes, we can tackle on the national, local, and international level, but until the demand is not criminalized, the situation will continue. And therefore, I strongly believe in changing national legislation in order to address the issue. And therefore, I give you these uh, tools. I'm good. Now is promise an example, as I like to do, giving promise an example. Sweden. I, t I, told, I talked to Jakob. Jakob, I'm going <coughs> to revise your country. In last uh, seminar, it has been absolutely criticized in the worst way because of using the equality uh, in, in a specific way. Now, because they are using the equality, it's, uh, they created this great law on, on prostitution in 1999. It has been the first law in the whole world, basically where they criminalize the purchase of sex and decriminalize the person. So, uh, and it's called either the Swedish model or Nordic model. Sweden was the first country who legalized the, uh, to, who um, criminalized the purchase of sex. Then in 2008, 2009, accordingly, Norway and Iceland joined them. <coughs> now, 10 years later, Swedish government have studied what was the good, uh, what was the bad of, of, this, um, of this law. And, uh, and since the introduction, introduction of the law, they came to this conclusion that street prostitution in Sweden has been halved. Then there was an increased public support of the ban and change of attitude with regard to the purchase of sexual services. If, if, if I can tell you very uh, briefly, I'm a fan of Swedish model. So what is it? If you use sexual service, it used to be only half a year in prison. Now in, they are uh, 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 looking at this law again. It's one year. If you're a pimp, six years in prison. If you're a trafficker, eight years in prison. If you're a child, two years in prison. And not only that, just trying to criminalize man, they also do the work of man, man because if there are studies, if you're gonna, if you find, I'm sure you, there are so many books you can always look at the sex buyer. If you think of who is the sex buyer, who are those men who are using sex? Sometimes we just think they are those low key, uh, maybe out of prison people we just think very lowly of the people but un unfortunately the statistics showed most of these people have too high education middle-aged man very good uh, salary family or co-partner children so you can see the picture it's absolutely different so this picture shows really well who is the sex buyer and therefore, uh, in Sweden, not only they're trying to criminalize uh, the purchase of sex, they're trying to work with men. Why they use a prostitute? Why, apart from having a wife? Of course, I'm not going to go into the psychology of this, of this uh, situation, but I was talking with people who, in Sweden about the situation. They have programs because nobody wants to go to prison. It's such a shaming thing, but things have to be addressed somehow, not only by uh, criminalizing, but working among work, among men. And therefore they, uh, so, and they're just thinking it's not enough what they're doing, they would like to do more, and to further research on who purchases sexual services, and to support children, to continue information, uh, work, and et cetera, et cetera. Then, uh, well, I mean, I'm a fan of international documents, so, so you, there is another document you can also look at who support uh, work against trafficking in human beings. 
So, but uh, just for information, you, you can ask me later and uh, take notice of those international uh, documents. And then after that, European Commission realized, uh, I guess two years ago, then they cannot work without civil society, without you and me working on the ground who understand the issue. And therefore, they created a platform. There are 170, uh, around 170 different civil society who uh, answered to the call of proposal and became part of this initiative. And after that, they realized it's not enough working on this with 170 uh, different organizations. Now they create even further e-platform of different organizations who can online share their resources and um, expertise, etc., and they can. So basically, uh, of course, uh, I maybe mean, Julia from here would uh, help because we we're thinking, like, just trying to see how European Commissions ask us questions about, for example, implementations of, of the directive. How you and your organization do specifically to encourage the government to implement the directive how you or your organization can work together on the progress made on the implementation, because it's, um, it's all of us together, and education assistance, basically what are the key challenges? What are your needs in, in facing identification assistance and protection? How can you collaborate with the national administration in regards to different national policies? And then, uh, Demand reduction, which is I was talking to you, for me, I believe it's a key issue. How we can reduce the demand? What are the current challenges? How you can be involved? How can European, European Commission can contribute to curb the demand, as Article 18, which I quoted before, says? So, uh, so here's um, questions. Oh, never mind. So basically, I might have, I hope I not overwhelmed you, and I know I speak very fast, but for you just to start thinking, basically go on the website of European Commission, go to European Parliament, your national government, and see, I mean, I guess you realize the way I'll try to talk, how can we nationally, internationally, can criminalize the purchase of sex to, to be implemented into the national legislations? in order for us to make our work easier and work on the restitution of this woman. So that's me. Thank you.